Hi, this is Meta Spencer, and we're going to have a conversation today about some very important question. Is it possible to restore the climate to pre-industrial levels, or is that a crazy idea? And we're then going to talk about a particular technology that is has a great deal of promise for helping control the climate crisis. So I have three uh, friends here with me who already know each other. They've worked together and uh, on some of the same issues. So in, uh, I guess in California is Peter Fikowski, who is the founder of something called the Climate Restoration Foundation, which I haven't actually explored too much in terms of what they do, but you can tell by the title, it's good. And uh, in Switzerland is Oswald Peterson, who works for something called the Atmospheric Methane Removal. Uh, but it's really the same bunch of people doing the same things, I think. And I don't know where Franz Oeste is. In Germany. In Germany. Germany. Very good. And he's one of the two guys, I guess, who mostly invented the whole idea of being able to remove methane from the atmosphere by uh, shooting some uh, uh, iron salt aerosols into into collision with the uh, methane molecules. So we'll talk to uh, talk about that in a moment. But let me start off by saying that I was surprised on Saturday. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, Pugwash annual general meeting, and I was pitching the idea of having a series of hearings about several, about four different techn technological, let's say, uh, methods of uh, helping solve the climate crisis. And um, and mo mostly they would be uh, measures that would uh, actually help restore the climate to pre-industrial times. So when I, I uh, read my proposal as a motion, everybody got uh, agitated and said, no, no, you can't use that word climate restoration to pre-industrial times. It, 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 you can't do that. It doesn't, it's not possible. And so I thought, well, this is not the place to have that debate. We'll have that debate sometime else, but let's just get on with it. So I don't know what they finally wound up saying. I, I let them tinker with my motion as they, they saw fit. Anyway, it passed. And so we are going to have a series of, of shows that deal with the four measures that I think that are most uh, urgently needed and promising and which Canadians could do start right away, get it going within five years, whether or not anybody else in the world helps. So those are the measures that you will be hearing about consistently over the next uh, four months or so. Four months we're going to do once a week. We're going to have a show on one of these topics. So hang in there and watch these shows and then you can you can send your questions in. There will be Pugwashites joining us uh, to interrogate the experts that we will invite and they will help pick the, pick the um, experts to make sure we get a fair representation of all points of view. Anyway, I was so surprised that people don't think it's possible to restore the climate that I I got uh, I, I decided okay here let's have that conversation right off the bat. Now it, the first thing you need to know is that in pre-industrial times a couple of hundred years ago, the there was in the atmosphere there were about 280 um, parts per million of CO2. Uh, and uh, and if we uh, actually achieve the goal that most people think is realistic and that we should aim for by the year 2050, we the unfortunately, there will be 460 parts per mission, million, most likely in the atmosphere. That's a stupendous growth from 280 to 460. You can see what industrialization has done for us. We've been spewing this, all kinds of things into the atmosphere. And that means that if we are really successful uh, in the year 2050, there will be no more additions of CO2 than there are subtractions. So we'll call it net zero. And the, the, uh, the amount of carbon will stop increasing. But that's a long way to go, 2050. 
And it's by now about, uh, I think, 420 parts per million, if I'm not mistaken. Which yeah. means that if we are going to try to do something to restore the climate to the level that it was 200 years ago, we're going to need to mo- remove from the atmosphere about a trillion tons of carbon. Okay. Which uh, I've been reading, r- refreshing my memory with Peter Kiskowski's marvelous book called Climate Restoration this morning. And, and it turns out that that comes out to being a removal of about 50 gigatons per year of carbon. A, a, a gigaton is a billion tons. 50 billion tons a year from, oh, pretty soon we should start. And 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 removing this stuff. So if we can add, I think we can learn to subtract. And there are ways of doing it. So we are going to pay attention today to the ways in which it's possible to subtract, to remove carbon from the air that's already been put there, and so that we can go back to something like uh, 280 or 300 parts per million. And uh, that's what our goal is. And I don't think it's ridiculous, but let's see. So who wants to start us off with this little conversation? And then we'll move on to talking about iron salt aerosols. I'll I'll be happy to start since I sort of started it uh, eight years ago. And uh, if you, whoever it was who said that it's not possible to restore the climate, um, if you imagine that you're in, in his or her shoes and think, well, what's the evidence that that person would give that we can't do it? And there are probably two things. One is it's never been done before by humans. That's good evidence that it's impossible. Um, And the other is, if it were possible, we would be doing it. It's obvious. And so... I like fun. No, it's not. (laughs) (laughs) Right, exactly. But when I talk with uh, scientific experts, uh, when they actually sit down and think, they realize, they say that, you know, I always assumed that if it were possible, we would be doing it. And since we're not doing it, it must be impossible. <laughs> QED, proof made. Now, I don't have to say that this doesn't hold water when you actually look at it. So I, I, that's almost the end of the conversation because um, the, the flip side is, well, what's the evidence that it is possible? Uh, the first one is that uh, we've had ice ages over the last million years, about 10 of them. And each time that happens, nature removes about that same trillion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere and eventually puts it back in. But we know we've seen it done. And so we have no question that it's doable. And then uh, can we do it a thousand times faster using our engineering? And I've talked with a lot of experts and no one's ever proposed any reason that we won't be able to do it. Now, it's very clear that in the scientific literature, no one has proven it, right? No one's, no one's been paid to do the research to, to find the best way to do it, because that's never been a topic before. Mm-hmm. And so it is true that there's nothing in the literature. But I think that's the beginning and end of the question. Well, uh, okay. But no, I think it's not because it, you could say that there are certain things that we can do and certain things are that will be really a lot harder to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, for example, uh, Oswald, both you and Oswald sent me little emails with your ideas. And Oswald said, well, you know, we can't put the glaciers back on top of the Himalaya mountains, et cetera. That's probably true. I, I assume that if we restored the climate, we might have the the air temperature back to normal, but I don't know how we're going to put all those glaciers back. Well, that, that's, that's a good one, Meta. You know, the, the, actually, I think it's a really good example that um, if the only problem we had was to get glaciers back on the Himalayas, we could definitely do it. Right? Because, right? Because, no. you know, it's water. We, we have water pumps. You know, the amount of energy to pump that much water up on the Himalayas in the winter and freeze it, 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 it would be expensive, but it, you know, probably uh, less than a tenth of the global GDP. 
but it just happens that that's just restoring the Himalayas is not the top priority of humanity. Well, well we yes, but we there's some to. things that you you can't do because it's too inefficient. It would take too much energy to do it. It would cost you more energy than you would. I mean, you'd have to put out more CO2 or something to do it. I don't know. Oswald, what's your thought about this? I'm I'm butting in. Thanks. Um, thanks, Mada. There is a couple of things that we cannot restore. I think the Himalayan glaciers are a very obvious example. Um, the same is also true for all the ice we've lost in Greenland or in the Antarctica. Um, as uh, long as this ice is on the land and thousands or hundreds of meters above at sea level, I cannot see any, any way to restore that. But Peter is absolutely right. It's not a very important question. It is important, but not as important as temperature. Temperature is the key to all of this. So we can really confine this discussion to, can we restore temperature, global temperature, and leave all the rest out? Because that's just too many, 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 many things, which like forestation and um, deserts and all this cannot be immediately restored. It takes thousands of years, but it's not so important. Can we restore the temperature? If we can answer that with a yes, then that's wow, that's great. <laughs> if, we can, if we can go back to 1850 temperatures, that would really solve the problem. I mean, it wouldn't restore the climate completely, exactly to 1850, but it would do. 80% of the job or 90% of the job. So that's what we, what I call climate restoration is really temperature restoration. If, you, if we confine it to that, then it is possible, yes. Now I, I, I would uh, take a different tack on that. Um, I certainly the, uh, the UN has taken the temperature approach. Uh, the, when I first started work on this, I did the same. But I realized that there are so many different ways of measuring temperature and the causes of global average sea level temperature are, they're just hundreds, you know, how many water clouds, how many ice clouds, how much sulfur dioxide and, you know, ozone, all of these different factors. And so we don't really, I, so what I realized as an engineer that, um, putting on my engineering hat, that we don't have any easy way to change the temperature. But the CO2, on the other hand, uh, there's universal agreement that the fundamental cause of climate change is the increase in CO2. And we do know exactly how to get CO2 out and measure it definitively. And so by focusing on CO2 rather than temperature, now, we, it, now it's an engineering problem and not a political problem. I think the, the, the scientific uh, community uh, was brought in by the political community you know, to, uh, for political reasons. And then they, they developed the political approach of, of temperature. Uh, but uh, again, from an engineering perspective, CO2 is the, uh, I, uh, is the only way I, I can see an engineering solution. So the goal then is to bring uh, the carbon, the CO2 down from the atmosphere to 280 or 300 ish parts per million by the year 2050, and then you would say, "Let's have a party because we're we made it." Just yes. That. Okay. Yeah, as well. Well, I want to add that it's not only CO2. It's it's um, at this stage actually, if we look at current global warming, that like the global warming that we get this year, 40 percent of that additional global warming we get is not from CO2, it's from methane and other global uh, greenhouse gases. And therefore, we cannot only look at CO2, it's a, it's a very common mistake. We have to look at all greenhouse gases. There is methane, there is SO2, which, which is a cooling greenhouse gas, very important. There's ozone, and there's many others. I'm, I'm sure France knows many more, but... Uh, <laughs> Just concentrating on the on the on the four most important one. Very important. There is one that is actually cooling the climate. So that is um, SO2, and um, we have to really look at the whole bunch of GHGs or greenhouse gases to get a clear view on what is to be done. And that is 
restore the greenhouse gases to their previous levels. And that, if, if you formulate it like that, then, then I'm with Peter, but not only CO2. That's, that's Can I ask Franz, your point of view, um, because... Yeah, my, my point is, uh, uh, I look uh, uh, on the ocean and I see the, the ocean surface is uh, warming by the warm climate. Uh, the climate this year is very warm. For instance, in Germany now, we have uh, more than 20 uh, Celsius per day. That's totally uh, uh, un unusual, these high temperatures in short before November. So uh, the, the ocean is, is warmed at the surface, and that makes a stratification, you know. And this stratification uh, um, uh, keeps the the exchange between deep ocean water and uh, which is good fertilized with the ocean uh, surface, uh, where the uh, algae and the the, the plankton lives. Uh, they they get not enough uh, uh, nutrition. And so uh, they cannot work as they should. And they are the uh, main uh, 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 things to get the CO2 into the ocean and uh, 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 into the sediments at last. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you see the, the uh, uh, glaciers, uh, when they come to the uh, ocean side, in uh, Antarctica or in Greenland, uh, they they are not thawing alone from above, but the warm ocean water, which is is thawing these uh, ice sheets from below, and that's the um, uh, main problem. We must cool the climate as to restore the the ocean too. This uh, problems must be seen in. In uh, they are in, uh, coordinated, and uh, uh, we found the we looked how how um, nature did this, and uh, uh, you know in the in the glacial times, uh, the uh, uh, there had been uh, uh, cold uh, times which suddenly were uh, abrupt, uh, stopped by warming, by abrupt warming. And uh, then uh, uh, the cooling again came. The, the ice uh, 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 core, course taken from, from in, in Greenland and in Antarctic uh, showed that uh, all times when the dust in the atmosphere had been very, very dense, uh, you know, in, in the cold times, in the, in the ice ages, the uh, fruitful less uh, layers had been uh, 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 produced. It was all the dust which uh, ca came from the atmosphere during this time. And every time when we had this dust in the atmosphere, the ice uh, course showed that CO2 and methane go down. So uh, there is a, a, a mechanism which uh, uh, did this, the dust has some ingredients which can reduce CO2 and ah. and uh, 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 methane, both. Aha. I see where you're going because I, I couldn't see what you were driving at for a minute. What's this dust all about? You're getting at that the, this dust must have had iron salt in it. Is that it? Uh, so, so, yes, the iron. <laughs> you know, the same well, that's iron. That's how you figured it out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The iron uh, uh, 
when it falls into the ocean, it feeds the uh, phytoplankton. And this takes CO2 from the air into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there is another chemist, uh, uh, chemical mechanism uh, of this iron. And uh, there is uh, sulfur. You know, phytoplankton produce uh, a chemical like uh, dimethyl sulfide. This dimethyl sulfide uh, is emitted in the in the air over the ocean, and uh, is oxidized in the in the air by the natural mechanisms of the 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 air. And what is the end product of that is sulfuric acid. Mm. This sulfuric acid makes very tiny uh, uh, droplets lower than uh, uh, 0.1 micrometer. Mm. And uh, these uh, uh, tiny droplets make uh, uh, our cloud condensation nuclei. Everywhere, and you can see it even today, where you have a, a, a greenish ocean with plankton in it, uh, you find also much more clouds on the ocean, which is uh, produced by this dimethyl sulfuric acid mechanism and uh, uh, produces uh, not only clouds, but the surface of these clouds are whiter than uh, uh, clouds. Mm. Uh, and, and this acts as uh, these clouds, these white clouds, act as uh, uh, they increase the albedo of the Earth. The mm. sun shines on them, and uh, these white clouds uh, 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 reflect the light back into the space. So, you know, Below every cloud in summertime or so, you know, it's, it's much cooler than in the sunshine. That's the effect. This is fascinating. Now, so what you are doing is you're tying together two of the different mechanisms of cooling the planet. One has to do with the production of the aerosol iron, which knocks out the methane, right? And yes. then you're tying this to the production of the growth of phytoplanktons in the ocean yeah. and the production of sulfuric acid, which brightens the clouds so that we have two yeah. different mechanisms that are, that are working, uh, to, um, uh, working together or somehow working in, in uh, opposite directions. I don't know how it's working, but, but it sounds like that you've tied together two things that I didn't realize were connected oh, at all. Uh, the the right? main thing I I forgot me uh, uh, we must uh, mention also the things how does this dust reduce methane? Sure, mm -hmm. that part I knew we were going to talk about, <laughs> and, <laughs> but uh, I didn't know uh, you were going to tie them I, together. <laughs> you know, uh, this sulfuric acid it reacts also in the in the air over the ocean with the salt haze particles which are there, yes, yes, yes. It, it changes them, these uh, particles, from sea salt into sulfate. Mm -hmm. And the uh, hydrochloric acid is evaporated from them. Mm -hmm. And this uh, uh, hydrochloric acid reacts with the mineral dust particles and changes the iron of the mineral dust particles into iron three chloride. Mm -hmm. And this iron three chloride is very sensitive to sun radiation. This is reduced, it goes from iron three to iron two. It is chemical reduced, we say. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this uh, reduction it needs an electron, and iron takes this electron from the nearby chloride ion, from iron three chloride, 
so it produces iron two chloride, and this free iron atom, atomic uh, uh, not iron, atomic chlorine. And atomic chlorine is known to be 16 times, at least 16 times, more active than the OH radical, which in the atmosphere is the main oxidant of methane and other organics, which is in the atmosphere. So uh, this uh, alert dust produces by this, in, in the chemical way, a methane depletion and uh, iron uh, fertilization in the ocean. And so we get methane depleted and uh, 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 also CO2 uh, uh, absorbed in the ocean. So the same chemical reaction knocks out the methane and fertilizes the, the, the plankton. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, uh, the phytoplankton <laughs> itself is the is a motor of this uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, action. Mm -hmm. Thank it's, you. Okay, Oswell, I, I know you were a moment ago just eager to speak. What was on your mind then? I'd say three because there's three. Um, you already mentioned two. Uh, Franz did, and uh, that was methane plus the clouds that were generated. But there's also a third one, and that is that. The fact that this phytoplankton, when it grows, it binds CO2. So we mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. so we have really the three effects here with one with one action. We do one action, we insert ISA into the atmosphere, and we get three effects. That is methane depletion, we get CO2 depletion, and we get additional cloud production. Brilliant, human. brilliant. Well, my God had and, his thinking cap on that day when he invented that. Now, let's see. Tell me, though, are there any downsides to this? Because the first people watching this, the first thing they're going to say is, yeah, but there's going to be something unexpected consequences that you, you hadn't planned for, and, and it's going to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do you think uh, would be any of the potentially negative consequences of doing this. By the way, I mean, we should say what we're doing. The chemical that you, uh, uh, reaction that you're, you're noting here is something that can be produced and done. We could get, get more of this iron dust and spray it around where there's methane and knock out the methane and, and fertilize the plankton and, and create clouds. It was wonderful. But so we, that, that's, a, that's a strategy or a, a tactic or a mechanism. But then people are going to say, "Aha! Uh -huh, you know, I'm but, scared to do anything like that." So, what what might go wrong? Let me say two so, things. Uh, let me say two things here. Okay. First, this process happens now. It's not a new process. It's not something we introduce. It's happening now. It is a natural process that happens all the time since millions of years. It's not something new that we introduced in the atmosphere. No. It is already happening all the time. And we can observe it in nature without adding anything. We can just observe it. We can see it happen. But we can see that it is a natural process. And that natural process is not harmful. In the opposite, it's very important for us that this process happens. All we do is what we suggest is to enhance, that's what we call it, enhance atmospheric methane oxidation, because atmospheric methane oxidation happens all the time, and we only enhance it. We add a catalyzer, that is FeCO3, that again already exists in the atmosphere. It's not a new substance, but we make more of it. We add some more, and then then that process will happen faster. So we will accelerate the oxidation. And that is not harmful because we have much more methane in the atmosphere. We have two and a half times more methane in the atmosphere than we used to have. So that therefore it is a good idea to make that methane disappear faster because then we go back to the normal level that we had before. Basically, we are only giving the answer to the fact that we have added all this methane to the atmosphere. So 
uh, the, the, the bad thing that you say, it has already happened. It, it is already happening. And that is the fact that there is so much methane in the atmosphere. That is the bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what I wanted to say, there is another uh, greenhouse gas, uh, the tropospheric ozone. You know, ozone in the stratosphere is very helpful because it uh, 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 the sun radiation UVB is uh, blocked by this. And uh, but uh, tropospheric ozone is not so so healthy. It comes from where where much uh, traffic uh, happens and so on. And this is uh, also depleted by by R3 chloride uh, uh, by this by this mechanism. Um, but uh, yes. Well, if, if I could add uh, just a, a sp explicit answer to Meta's question of what uh, what, what uh, uh, unexpected consequences might happen um, uh, when the iron uh, iron fertilization was done tested ten years ago, uh, there were several unexpected outcomes. Uh, one was that the species of salmon that they were hoping to uh, the, the the species of salmon that that ate the the phytoplankton and grew was a different species than the one they had expected. So just the dynamics of the ocean were different. It, it, I I forgot which one is which, but they ended up growing a lot of uh, pink salmon. Um, I think they wanted coho. Uh, and the other consequence that was unexpected was uh, 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 birth of new whales of uh, orca whales. There hadn't been any orca whales born for about nine years until then. And the orca whales have a two-year gestation. And sure enough, two years later, there were about seven whales born. Again, presumably because they had food. And so the, the, the female whales' bodies knew that it was safe to, to give birth because there was food. Unfortunately, it was just food that one year. And I don't know how many of the young, young whales actually survived. But... Uh, most of us, I think, would consider that good consequences, not bad consequences. Mm -hmm. um, and to this time, no one has ever described any actual bad consequences. And so uh, the healthier fish, healthier whales is good. Um, people fear that uh, if you produce more phytoplankton, that that could be a, a bad plankton, a bad algae bloom. Um, and those do happen, of course, where you have uh, rivers and estuaries, and this, you have a lot of nutrients, and then you can, you can get dead zones. That never happens in the deep ocean. That is to say, it's never been reported, and no, no scientists who understand the ocean expect that it will happen uh, mm -hmm. in reality. So that, that's a good sign. Now, one thing people worry about if you get phytoplankton growth, if you get any kind of a healthy ocean, as the, as the phytoplankton and fish grow near the surface, when they die and fall in the, into the deep ocean, when they decompose, that will suck oxygen out of the deep ocean, which is already oxygen depleted. Mm -hmm. So that since the beginning of time, that's always been the case. And if you, if you grow more organic matter at the surface, you will have a bit more ox oxygen depletion underneath. But uh, if you, the only way to have less oxygen depletion underneath is to kill the surface, uh, which unfortunately we're doing with our, our, uh, <laughs> our pollution and our uh, uh, climate change. But recovering that is going to improve this, the, uh, the health of the ocean surface, and it'll consequently, consequently deplete oxygen in the depths. I'm glad you mentioned that because that was one of the few things that had sort of bothered me, but I thought it was too complicated to bring up here. <laughs> but um, there, I've had uh, shows with Peter Ward uh, and, and uh, Paul Werbos about extinction phenomena and previous extinction phenomena like the Permian, I believe several of them, may have been caused by the emission of hydrogen sulfide from the ocean, 
which was according to this one account, the one I heard, was caused by a stratification of the ocean, uh, so that the the, the 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 you know the different levels of the ocean have different contents, and when uh, in in a very stratified ocean, when um, biological products fall to the bottom of the ocean, they can create hydrogen sulfide there, which then could be lethal, and apparently that was the thing that killed off 95% of all living creatures. So we want to, uh, you know, watch out for that. But uh, I'm also glad that you mentioned the whales, because one of the things that we've done that's really, uh, you know, exacerbated the stratification of the ocean is kill all the whales. The whales go up and down all the time, and they're stirring up the ocean. And there were hundreds of them, and now there are many, many less. So if we could bring back a whole bunch of whales, that's going to help uh, offset the, the tendency uh, for uh, ocean stratification, which would be the the one condition that makes what you've mentioned more more risky. Is Am, am I right or not? Yes, I, yes, I, yes. Scientific knowledge is very thin, but... Um, that's the way Go I ahead, Franz. Hmm? I, I wanted to tell of, uh, of the lant lanternfish. The lanternfish uh, go up and down in the ocean. And mm -hmm. they, they is, is the hugest mass of fish. The most fish are lanternfish. Hmm. And they go daily up and mm -hmm. down a, a thousand meters. Really? And uh, they they eat uh, in the night uh, the uh, uh, phytoplankton there. But uh, if if the phytoplankton is reduced, you have less lanternfish, and so uh, this up and down, which uh, also moves uh, uh, the the uh, fertilizer from the deep depths into to the surface. Uh, uh, this al also would would be reduced. Not only the whales, but and also other other uh, kind of uh, zooplankton makes uh, these uh, up and down to uh, get away from their predators. Uh, what I what I wanted to say, uh, the um, uh, fertilization, which uh, had been done by uh, solutions of iron sulfate and so on, which were uh, uh, put from from ships into the ocean. Uh, that uh, is not the thing uh, uh, of uh, this uh, 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 raining down uh, uh, of iron three chloride. Uh, into the ocean. Uh, we have less than one milligram per uh, square meter a day. Um, so the the uh, uh, fertilization effect is a very low effect only, is a very low effect. And uh, we, we don't do it on land because there it helps not so much. We do it Away from the coasts in the in the uh, ocean deserts, uh, where we have not much uh, 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 mm -hmm. green uh, uh, phytoplankton, mm -hmm. there is the ocean uh, totally blue, without uh, uh, much phytoplankton. Heard we had a guy um, Brian von Petzen on talking about raising seaweed in farms in what turns out to be large areas of the oceans, which he calls deserts because they lack sufficient iron to, new, to yeah. nourish the fish and so on. So by putting uh, kelp and other seaweed farms out there, you can create uh, a habitat for a whole lot more fish than we're able to, uh, to, to redo, remove for food uh, at present. Right, so uh, yeah. this phy phytoplankton would have some of the same effects as creating more food for fish, right? Uh, uh, surely, yes. 
that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this uh, macroalgae uh, 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 breeding and farming, what is done by uh, Brian von Herzen, uh, uh, when it, it falls down to the uh, ocean floor much faster and doesn't oxidize meanwhile. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, phytoplankton are so tiny, uh, are very tiny particles. Uh, most of them oxidize, but mm -hmm. uh, this uh, carbon, which uh, is uh, uh, reoxidized in the depths, it may come back uh, in a thousand years. Mm -hmm. It lasts very long uh, uh, if it comes uh, uh, back to the surface. But uh, the phytoplankton is the the uh, uh, is a is a top tip of the of the uh, uh, food chain, you know, and uh, it feeds many other species in the ocean, uh, and at last also the whales, which go up and down, and these uh, species also uh, will die. They live not forever. And they fall down on the ocean uh, ground mm -hmm. and bring the, the carbon into the sediment also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, one well, of the other things that I want to explore, because, um, it, it, you know, I've been very concerned about the Arctic and the methane deposits at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean under it's it's sort of held down by a layer of permafrost, especially on these shelves of the of the ocean of the Arctic, and uh, the, we know that there are enormous deposits of methane under there, which every now and then these things get perforated and these things, the gases come up uh, and and it's it's really a problem there now, but it can become a catastrophe if a huge explosion takes place because the melting permafrost enables uh, something to blow up, and so we don't know what the odds are, but it would be a, probably the end of life on the planet if, if all of that came up in one big burst. So the idea that you know keeps me awake at night is. What if something like that happens and it, we have absolutely no way of of repairing the situation once a, a terrible burst of that kind occurs? But then, you know, uh, what Peter uh, m mentioned or something came out of this conversation was that, you know, you could use this iron salt aerosol uh, dust and uh, fly over the big burst of, of methane and scatter a huge amount of it and knock out the methane that way. So it could be uh, potentially a, a solution to uh, a, a catastrophic explosion of methane. Is that is that crazy or not? I see Oswald. Well, 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 let, let, me, let me clarify, let, because okay. you, you got a uh, detail wrong there. OK. So um, uh, the, the methane burst, a fatal methane burst, well, uh, a massive methane burst could happen. And we don't. No, of course, that the last time we lost our planet lost its polar ice cap, the 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 sea ice. That the last time that happened, we did get a massive burst, which which extincted about a third of the species. So that would be very bad. Now, um, and we don't have any proof that that won't happen again. So, uh, as a parent and a grandparent, I really want an insurance policy. So then the insurance policy is if the methane does come out, can we oxidize it fast enough so that perhaps we lose one, one harvest, maybe two, but not, not eight, right? If we lose eight sequential harvest because the planet got so hot, that, that would be, could be the end of our civilization. One harvest, uh, you know, the, the, those kinds of things happen in our civilization. And iron iron salt aerosol, you would you uh, you would actually just do it in the sunny areas, uh, as Franz said. It's activated by light from the sun, and so you would do it in dry sunny areas over the ocean. And there are quite a few of those areas. There's enough wind in the atmosphere that it, it'll blow the the methane around. Does, there's no need to do apply the iron salt aerosol over the over where it comes out. The wind will mix it, and it's free. 
Okay. Now you say you corrected what my mistake. Where where did, where did I misinform? Oh, you, you wouldn't you would apply the iron salt aerosol in sunny areas, not not where not in the Arctic where the methane's coming out. Because the Arctic tends okay, to Okay, so you can do it anywhere in on the on the planet as long as it's over water and where it's sunny. Yes. Okay, thank you. Can and, yeah. Yeah. Excuse. Can, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, you know, iron is it makes the lustrous brown. It colors the lustrous, and if you do it uh, too close to the ice sheets, it will color color co color the ice sheets brown. That's what happened also in the glacial times. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it it the 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 dust in the atmosphere <laughs> became more and more, and also colored the ice sheets brown, and at last, these uh, albedo re reduction induced the 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 short warm times between the the the. Oh, that, that that's very good. Reason. I've never, I've never heard that before, Franz. That, that makes perfect sense. Thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 uh, I can give you the uh, reference for that. I, I, it's, yeah, it's not my you. idea. No, no, but but it, it's it's one of those things that you wonder what caused the end of the ice ages, yeah. and the CO two has gone down, which increased the amount of dust and the amount of dust on the vast areas of ice. Yeah would warm the temperature. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, the uh, uh, we created uh, also solutions for the, the ice, uh, for the oceans near the ice sheets, which are, uh, which use not iron, uh, instead is uh, enriched with uh, titanium dioxide. Hmm. This oh, is. Uh, excuse uh, me. Uh, I'm sorry. This is a, a very white, white uh, oh, interesting. Uh, right. substance, and uh, it cannot uh, produce any uh, coloration of the ice. Thank you, Oswald. Well, I just wanted to confirm from my personal life that here in Switzerland we we often have Sahara dust coming over the Alps, and then the snow gets really red. It's not white anymore. That happens here every year. Mm. And then the meteorologists in the TV will say, okay, you will have Sahara dust, and then you can really see it. It's very red. And um, then for a couple of days, it's red, and then maybe there's more snow coming, then it's gone again. So it's not very long lasting, but in the Arctic, it might be all winter because maybe it doesn't snow anymore. And then the full season of not white, but yeah, brownish uh, ice or snow cover. Yes, Franz. Um, you mentioned the uh, perm uh, extinction. Uh, it uh, is in combination with, happened in the combination with the, uh, uh, I believe, uh, uh, the Siberian traps and and uh, um, uh, there, there were huge volcanic uh, uh, eruptions of basaltic lava. And they produced uh, and they hit. Uh, they came through uh, the uh, layers of of coal and uh, emitted uh, from the coal a lot of methane and CO two and so on. And additional, they produced large amounts of, of ash. And this ash is known uh, as to be a very uh, intense um, fertilizer for the ocean. Mm. Mm. And uh, uh, if, you, if you look at the Icelandic glaciers or even the Green, Greenlandic ice sheet, there you see black layers. In, in these ice sheets from these volcanic ash. Hmm. Okay. And this well, ash uh, produces uh, 
surely uh, phytoplankton blooms, which uh, may have uh, produced lots of uh, organic carbon uh, in the ocean, which uh, became uh, 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 which took the oxygen out of it of, of the ocean, and also uh, uh, used sulfate. The, you know, uh, there are bacteria which use sulfate instead of uh, oxygen, and this sulfate then becomes to uh, reduce to H two S. Uh, um, this, uh, uh, you know. You know this gas mm -hmm. you mentioned Excuse before. Me, I, I need to go. So I just want to say thank okay. you, and, and we'll talk a little later. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. <laughs> okay. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and and this uh, H2S uh, uh, makes this toxic uh, uh, ocean and this uh, depletion, what you said. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen sulfide, yeah. Thank uh, you for that. Now, uh, uh, Oswald, yes. Uh, and then I want I want us to get down to talking about the practicalities of what your project would involve, you know, because you actually want to do something. But uh, but uh, speak first, and then we'll get to that. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing regarding the risks, because you had asked for the risks. And of course, um, since we would introduce ISA into the atmosphere, we cannot be a hundred percent sure of what will happen, it, because it's a new thing and therefore we will have to observe it. But if you look at our plans, it is a steady growth, which we propose over 20 years. So we will start small and we will add and add and add. And during those years, we can observe what happens. So we are not like coming with a big bang. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly we do something and then uh, we will look what will happen, but we'll introduce it over many, many years. And there we can observe exactly what, what implications it has. And if there was any risk, we can still stop it at any time. So there is, of course, no absolutely risk-free management of the climate. I always use this word global climate management because that's what we will have to do. And there is no risk-free options but there's certainly one very risky option and that is not doing anything exactly yeah whatever we do is much more likely to be helpful than uh than what we know we've got coming at us <laughs> okay look can please explain to me what you would like to accomplish i mean how, what what can you do within the next five years that would set us on a course of being able to actually use uh, this iron salt method as a way of reducing the methane in the uh, atmosphere now. Okay, so if we had the finance, that's the problem. If we had the finance, we could, in within one and a half years, build a prototype that can actually show on a very small scale how this machine works, right? It's a small disperser. We would place this disperser on an existing oil rig because it has a tower. We just use that and show how we can disperse our catalyzer into the atmosphere. Of course, this will be a machine that is about a thousand times smaller than the actual machine that we will want to pose into the, into the ocean. However, it will be big enough to show the effect. Right, so it's like a public demonstration. At first, it's going to be a trial version, and then we will try to optimize it, and all the technicians will work on it and get it all optimized. And then we will do a field test, which means that we will invite the public to see that it actually removes methane from the atmosphere. Once we have done that, it's a very small scale. It's about as, as big as a truck engine, I always say. So it's, it's, it's about as risky as running a truck engine on an oil, on an oil um, platform. So it's not risky at all. But of course, the big machine is a thousand truck engines. So okay, that's a bit harder. That's a bit more. But the small one will already show us. It will already be able to show, okay, there is FPCF3, maybe a couple of kilograms. 
dispersed in the atmosphere and we can show that the methane is actually reduced, right? In a very small scale. Mm -hmm. So that will take about two years. And then once we've done that, and it's all approved and we've gone through all the necessary steps and all the necessary permission and the, oh, it's very, very complex. Then we can actually build one, one of these machines. We want to put 40 into the ocean, but we would build one. 40, one, 40 of them? 40, yes. That's our idea. That's mm -hmm. that's what we need um, to get the methane out of the atmosphere. And if we have one that costs 200 million, so that's not 2 million, but 200 million, and that would be custom built. It would not be just an oil platform. It would be custom built for that purpose. It would be 400 meter high, quite a big building on the ocean that can float. So you can pull it out into the ocean, place it exactly on the right spot where we need it in the subtropic oceans, where it's really hot and windy because we need wind for dispersion and we need heat for the process to happen, as we already pointed out. And then we have the first, what we call methane removal plant or MRP out in the ocean. And then we can double that and then we can build 40 of them. So that will take 20 years. But okay, you had 40 of them and you start off small. You're just not, uh, you're using the 40, but you're not dispersing so much of the dust right away. But gradually, year by year, you spray more of the dust out into the atmosphere, right? And uh, over what period of time could you project removing what amount of the methane and how much effect would that have on global warming? That uh, People are going to say, well, what's, uh, you know, what do we get for our dollars? How, how <laughs> much uh, result will we expect to achieve by uh, building these things? And uh, you need to be persuasive that you can accomplish something. It's, it's really very simple. Methane produces 0.5 degrees of warming, right? So that's the additional methane that we have produced since 1850. So we are limited. We don't want to go under the natural level. So we only want to go back to the natural or the pre-industrial level, right? So that's the potential. There's no more than 0.5 degrees because that's all the methane. If we can re reduce it to the pre-industrial level, then we have 0.5 degrees. Now that can be done by either emission reduction. That means we, we just stop putting more methane into the atmosphere. That's hopefully, that's the best way. And there is, you know, the global methane pledge signed by all the big leaders to reduce methane. So hopefully that will be done. Plus methane reduction with our ISA, right? So we say probably, hopefully the methane emission will do half the job and we do the other half, right? But potentially we can also do the whole job. It's, it's not limited, it's just we need some more methane removal plants to, to, to do uh, the full job. But hopefully methane emission reduction will work and therefore we don't need to do the whole job. Sometimes people uh, estimate how much per ton of CO2 reduction uh, something costs. And then, you know, they, you, you get things estimated 100 or 100 to $200 per ton, et cetera. That's right. uh, what estimate. kind of, if you were trying to t turn it into costs, what we kind estimate of estimate that, would you produce? Yeah, yeah we estimate that to be two, uh, around $2 per ton of CO2 equivalent. Now, we think in method. So... Of course, we think in how many dollars per ton of methane, but then you have to convert it into CO2 equivalent because everybody talks about CO2 equivalent, and we are not talking about the CO2, we are talking about right. the methane. Therefore, you have to say how much methane is equivalent to the CO2. Wait, the well, let's clarify for people because we, we never made that explicit. When you knock out a methane molecule, what you're doing ultimately is turning it into CO2 and water, right? Now, That's the right. CO2 is not anything we want. We'd love to get rid of that for sure. That's what we mostly focus on. But we'd sure as prefer having a, a CO2 uh, molecule to having a methane molecule because the methane is 20 or 30 times worse as far as greenhouse gas, right? 
So we are not getting rid of CO2. We're actually increasing it a little bit, but it's a whole better deal than than uh, it, it would be. Am I right? Is that exactly right? right. Mm-hmm. You know that it also put away the CO2. Yeah. When it falls in the ocean by the next rain. Okay. Then then it takes the CO2 also. Okay. Which it has produced before. We have already talked about that, the fact that we have three effects, but we if we concentrate on the method, if we only look at the method. Then, of course, there's CO2 coming out of the methane because the methane is converted into CO2 and water, as you have said. But still, methane is about 120 times, 120 times more warming than CO2. The only reason why we always talk about it being only 25 times is because methane naturally oxidizes anyway, right? So all we do is shorten its lifespan, right? And therefore, we must be careful if we look at 100 years, then in those 100 years, after 12 years, the method would have oxidized anyway, right? So now if we shorten the lifespan by six years, for example, we halve it, then we have six years without method out of those 100 years. So therefore, the calculation is is a bit different. And that's what they call the global warming power, and the most conservative numbers that you find is 25. So that means that 25 tons of CO2 are equivalent to one ton of methane. And that's what the IPCC uses. That's what all the scientists use. And other people say it's more. But we as AMR, we always take the most conservative numbers. Say, okay, 25 is good. Okay. Well, we uh, listen, I want you to name, if people are interested in your project and want to find out more, uh, yeah, our website is called www.amr.earth. And I will show a little picture. That is a little graph that shows the process. Enhanced atmospheric methane oxidation. You see all the methane being produced by cows and by volcanoes and by uh, some... Mm-hmm. That's, uh, and here and this we thing up at the top is the link. I'll put that. Uh, I'll put yeah. it in to Here's see. our website, amr.earth. Then mm-hmm. there you find many pages. Let's hope people all go get get enthusiastic about it because I am. Okay. Thank you both very much. Thanks see a lot. Bye bye, friends. Goodbye. Goodbye, Oswald. Project Save the World produces these shows. And this is episode 516. You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website to savetheworld.ca. You can share information there, too, about six global issues. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar with the name of one of the guest speakers. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can subscribe for $20 Canadian per year. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser and in the search bar, enter the word peace. You'll see buttons to click to subscribe.